This audio clip may be disturbing to some listeners, but it's important that the public listens to the voice and helps investigators identify the driver of that vehicle. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? Uh, we're going. No, we're not. Yeah. Then where the fuck are these roads going to? The 50th Street. 50th Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Hey, you and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this here video, we're going to look at the terrifying case of Amber Tuckerow, who disappeared on August 18th, 2010. Amber was last seen alive when she left her hotel room in Nisku and was going to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Her body was found two years later. No one knows what happened to her, but what we do know is that she got a lift with some unknown man. And the terrifying thing about this case is that whoever she got the lift with, whoever he was, you could hear his voice on a phone call she made. And the phone call is terrifying. She knows she's not being taken where she wants to go, and she seems to know that this isn't going to end well. This case remains unsolved, but there are some suspicions about people who live in that area which we'll get into. All right, I think that's enough of an introduction. Let's get into it. Amber Tickerow was born on January 3rd, 1990 in Alberta, Canada. The only daughter of Vivian Tootsie Tickerow Amber and her mother had a close relationship. Amber herself was also a man, of 14-month-old Jacob, whom she loved very much. On August 17th, 2010, Amber, Jacob, and a female friend, they flew into Edmonton for like a, um, a little getaway. The trio stayed in a hotel outside the city in Nisku. The next day, Amber, for some unknown reason, she left Jacob with her friend and wanted to go into Edmonton alone. We don't know why she wanted to go into Edmonton, maybe she just had things to do. She never either told her friend or her friend never said, we don't know why. But, that was it. Amber never returned that night. Knowing that Amber would never leave her son Jacob for long, her friend contacted Amber's mom, Tootsie, who then called the police. Something was very wrong. When Tootsie contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they seemed extremely unconcerned and told Tootsie that they were sure she'd show up at some point and she was probably just out partying. Yeah, taking this uh, super serious as you can see. And after that, it gets even better. I'm being sarcastic, it really doesn't. <laughs> So on September 4th, 2010, Amber had been missing for two weeks now. Two weeks, like for fuck's sake. The RCMP announced that they didn't think Amber was in any danger, and they knew she was around the Edmonton area. They didn't um, know this, they were just talking shite. So without anyone having any contact with Amber, she had vanished. The RCMP removed her from the missing persons list the month following her disappearance been missing for over two weeks, left a 14-month-old child at home that she rarely left for very long. Yeah, yeah, like she's grand, she'll be fine, she'll turn up at some stage. As the case was closed, missing, not missing, but actually missing, her personal items left in the hotel room in Nisku were also destroyed, since there wasn't an open case, therefore leaving no possible evidence to be looked back on. Amber's mother Tootsie, she never gave up. She continued to fight for this case to be reopened, almost harassing the police, but they didn't care. This went on for two years. Suddenly, in early 2012, the RCMP told Amber's family that they now believed Amber was murdered. Shocking. I mean, I don't know what exactly made the RCMP give a shit about this case again, but it was probably that in August, a couple of months later, they released an audio recording to the public. They released 61 seconds of audio from a 17-minute call 
made from Amber's phone the night she vanished. The entirety of the call, it's never been released. Just one minute of 17. I'm RCMP Constable Ray Shelton. I'm an investigator with CARE, which is mandated with investigating unsolved homicides and vulnerable missing persons. Right now, we're asking for the public's assistance, your assistance, in solving one such investigation. This is the missing persons case of Amber Tuckerow, a 21-year-old female who went missing in August of 2010. In the early evening of August 18, 2010, Amber left the hotel room to find a ride into the city of Edmonton. We know that between 7.30 and 8 o'clock p.m., Amber got into a vehicle with an unknown male. While in that vehicle, Amber received a phone call, and through investigative means, we have obtained a recording of that phone call. That recording includes the voice of the unknown male driver of the vehicle. To date, that individual is unidentified. We're asking the public's assistance to listen to the tape in hopes that someone recognizes the male voice of the driver and phones investigators with that information. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you fucking kidding me? You better not take you better not take me anywhere I don't wanna go. I wanna go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? No, we're not. Then where the fuck are these roads going to? Fiftieth Street. Fiftieth Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? Fiftieth Street. 50th Street. We believe that rather than driving into the city of Edmonton, the mail drove south and east of Nisku into rural Leduc County. And subsequent to this phone conversation ending, no one has seen or heard from Amber. We believe the male driver of this vehicle has information that may assist police in finding Amber. At one point during Amber's journey into Edmonton, she was picked up by a man who was heard on the recording. She was likely hitchhiking. The call is terrifying. Amber knew something was horribly wrong and she knew she was not going where she wanted to go. The phone call, it was recorded because she had called her brother, Paul, who was in prison at the time. He was the person on the other end of the line. Here is a comment on a Reddit post that will give you a little bit more information about the area in which Amber vanished. In between the motel she was picked up to 50th Street, there are no perpendicular gravel roads that would connect. All roads are paved now. So we clearly took her down a parallel side road in the opposite direction. This was someone who knows the area and knows exactly where to go. This area is fairly sparsely populated, mostly small acreages and farmland. It takes about 10 minutes to get from Nisku Motel to 50th Street towards Beaumont. I drive that road 3 to 5 times a week. So, if the call was 17 minutes long, I strongly believe he was backtracking and heading down random side roads to confuse or disorient her. There are times when I'm on these roads at 9pm, and never see another car until I hit Beaumont, so I have a very easy time believing they could go unnoticed later in the night on the back roads. I think he drove her down Airport Road towards 50th, crossed 50th and then turned south towards OR 241. It would match the timeline. OR 241 is gravel. Whoever took Amber, they, they knew what they were doing. They knew the area extremely well, and it kind of seems like this wasn't their first time. We'll get into that. Four days after the recording was released, as a public plea for someone to come forward who recognized the voice in the car with Amber, a tragic discovery was made. On September 1st, 2012, horseback riders stumbled upon a skull in a farmer's field in Leduc. Uh, I bring you here today and I thank you very much for coming. Uh, the RCMP, RCMP confirmed today the human remains found on a rural property near Duke, Alberta on Saturday, September 1st, 2012, are those of Amber Abyssinian, who has been the subject of an RCMP missing person investigation 
since her disappearance in August 2010. A group of recreational horseback riders came upon what they believed to be a human skull and immediately contacted the RCMP at the Duke. Over the weekend, the remains were identified through dental records and with the assistance of the Edmonton Medical Examiner's Office and RCMP Forensic Identification Services, care investigators became involved. We consider the circumstances surrounding Amber Tuckerow's death to be suspicious. The skull, it was Amber's. No other remains of hers have ever been recovered. Due to the level of decomposition and only having partial remains, the cause of death could not be determined. In March 2014, Tootsie filed a complaint against the Ledic or CMP for the mistreatment of Amber's case. The RCMP wouldn't elaborate, but said its policies and procedures have changed as a result of the Amber Takaro investigation. We got something in black and white that says what you've been saying all along, that, that um, what should have been done wasn't done. It was in 2014 that Amber's family submitted a complaint to the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission for the RCMP. The findings were supposed to take no longer than 18 months, but ended up taking four years. In the 120-page report, the commission lists deficiencies in the police investigation into the young mother's case. What should have been done wasn't done right from the outset. Like, even for my sister to go missing, and then she was just taken off because somebody said they thought they'd seen her. And then again, that's one month that nothing was done on the case. But that's it. Amber's case, it remains unsolved. I mean, to the police it remains unsolved. To a lot of others, it don't. When the audio recording of Amber's phone call was released, and the police asked, if you recognize this voice, let us know. Three women, at least, came forward saying, yeah, I know that guy on that recording. I recognize that voice. All three women identified separately. The same guy. An investigator for the RCMP came forward, stating that the man accused of being the voice in the recording had been looked into and been ruled out as a person of interest. The women are, to this day, convinced it's that man's voice. So, who is this man of mystery? Pat Carson. He owns a ranch in Alberta, Canada, and there is a blog telling you to stay the hell away from him, and multiple blog posts telling you to be careful in the area. He owns a ranch and himself and the ranch are constantly changing names. He is 72 and is an untreated sex offender. He was labelled a predator who engages in extensive planning to secure his victims. He was sentenced in 2002 to 18 months for sexually exploiting three girls under the age of 18 outside of Edmonton. He also had a previous five-year sentence for picking up underage prostitutes and choking them. In 2003, Randy White, who wrote the bill on the National Sex Offender Registry, made a statement to the Canadian Parliament warning them about him and that he would be out changing his name and doing God knows what. Pat Carson, who was also posted under the names uh, Ed Flynn and Bill O'Brien, had been luring young adult victims by placing newspaper advertisements to work at his ranch on a volunteer basis. Apparently, he is still placing ads on Craigslist and the like, looking for young people to come and work on his ranch. This is a posting he made on Kijiji? Kijiji. I think that's Kid. yeah, Kijiji. The most recent post on the blog was in September 2019. It tells you of the telltale signs you might be dealing with Pat Carson. No phone number given. The ad you were responding to is A on Kijiji, and B has many grammatical errors and misspelled words or is in broken English. The ranch has no website or Facebook page. You talk to the person who placed the ad and they give you a bad vibe or sound creepy or ask strange or inappropriate questions that make you feel uncomfortable. And no dogs allowed. There's even a post on the Let's Not Meet subreddit by Full Metal Cockblock, awesome name, about an encounter with Pat. If you're not familiar, Let's Not Meet is true stories, essentially creepy true stories people have had with other people that scared the shit out of them. Yeah, put the kettle on, let's have a little story time, shall we? I got married when I was 19, and my husband and I had no clue what to do with our new life together. 
We dropped out of college and our studio apartment was too expensive. We thought it was the ideal time to travel and have adventures before settling down. We came across a post on the internet from a man who was looking for workers on his horse ranch. He would provide all meals and lodging in exchange for labour around the ranch. It looked like just the solution for us. He claimed to be very knowledgeable in trades and would teach us to build machinery, woodworking, welding, blah blah blah. The pictures, they were beautiful. The log cabin he built was spacious and we would have a nice big bedroom. There were lots of other people in the photos too and in our correspondence with him, he always mentioned other people and referred to himself as we. He advertised on multiple platforms and everything looked really legit. So we booked our flight. There was nobody else there. He was in his 60s but mentally and physically very fit. One of the first things he said to us was, I never judge people based on their past. Do you believe people can change? I sure do. That's like definitely something a sex offender would say. Seemed harmless enough. He took us grocery shopping and told us to pick whatever we wanted. We immediately got the vibe that his kindness was forced and he was being over generous. I'm going to get right into listing the weird stuff we noticed. He built the house himself and his bedroom had a door to the only upstairs bathroom, which didn't lock from the inside. He would invite us into his room, and on his table was an old video camera, with about 30 little tapes strewn about. He would always talk about how much he loved the Japanese, how he specifically marketed towards them, and had a few Japanese ladies stay in the past. Oh Jesus. He often brought up people who had stayed with him before, and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. One day, he told us to get in the truck because we were going to the city. We were a long way out in the country, so it was a long ride, but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come with us and work on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. He got upset by our disapproval, so we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He went to talk to people on his own. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give way to a very temperamental and uh, aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy, but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. He had military training and was a big strong man. Cunning. Always thinking. Now, our parents never wanted us to go. They realized it could be a potentially dangerous situation, but we thought we had done our due diligence. However, we never even thought to Google the guy's name. I get an email from my mom one day, freaking out and telling me to do a Google search, then get on the next plane home. A quick search showed his arrest record, strangling and sexually assaulting a young woman, followed by headlines reading, do not go to this horse ranch. This man is dangerous. We were thoroughly creeped out and booked a flight home. We were then presented with the dilemma of how to tell a potentially dangerous man that we wanted to leave. Oh, I forgot to mention that he would tell us daily about how we could live there permanently and start a family. He would fantasize about Christmases with our future children and raising them on the ranch. We thought it was established that this was a um, very temporary thing and we had families back home who um, missed us. This was the weirdest part for me. I made up a lie about an emergency back home and when I told him, it was like he could see right through me. I'm convinced that he not only knew I was lying, but he knew I was going to lie about needing to leave before I even opened my mouth. This look came over him that I've never seen on a person before. He was angry, but hiding it. He was hiding so many thoughts and emotions that I couldn't tell if I should be frightened or relieved. Before I finished my sentence, he said, when do you need to go to the airport? Monotone. I told him right now. He took us and put on his friendliest personality and told us that if we ever wanted to come back to the ranch, he would pay for their flight tickets. We said we would be in touch. Police actually believe there is a serial killer in that area as four women, not counting Amber, 
went missing in that local area from 2002 to 2004. Edna Bernard was last seen on September 22nd, 2002. Her remains were found the next day. Katie Sylvia Ballantyne was last seen on the 28th of April, 2003. Her remains were found on July 7th, 2003. Dolores Brower was last seen May 15th, 2004. Her remains were found on April 19th, 2015. And Corey Ottenbright was last seen on May 9th, 2004. What the heck is going on in that area? I don't know. But if you're ever uh, around there, maybe, um, don't hitchhike. I think that's a good idea. And that is the story of Amber Tuckerow. Who knows what happened to her? Who knows who's behind it? But there are some suspicious characters uh, in that area. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, please let me know your thoughts about this case in the usual place. And if you'd like to see some more of my videos or future videos, you can watch them and subscribe if you'd like to. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Mike out.